Welcome to 7 Investing Now, a show that teaches you how to take a long-term view on investing by better understanding what's happening in the market now. Good afternoon, 7 Investors, and welcome to the Monday edition of 7 Investing Now. My name, of course, is Daniel Brooks Klein. I am the host of the program. I'm being joined today by Max Chatsko and Steve Symington. As you could tell, I went to a water park this weekend, so despite a ton of sunblock, I am redder than usual. <laughs> Uh, Steve, which mountain were you climbing or which like elk were you wrestling? What was going on this weekend? I was on a a boat actually, um, fishing for walleye. So I, I have a pretty wicked farmer tan myself. Like it's, yeah. So my, my whole body feels crispy right now. It hurts. I also have a very stark outline where my watch is, where like, it looks like I'm wearing a watch and I'm not, yeah. I, I've actually been taking my watch off at the pool, trying to tan this area. Uh, Matt Schatzko, not as nice in Pittsburgh at the moment. What did you do this weekend? Well, Saturday, I was kind of uh, knocked on my behind here. I was uh, from recovering from my second dose. So uh, I, I kind of laid low this weekend, Dan. Uh, second dose is, of course, code for Max drank too much. No, of course, it is the vaccine. <laughs> We're going to talk four big questions about the stock market. It's been a very strange set of conditions. After that, I'm going to talk about the very bizarre merger between AT&T and Discovery. I, I do not like this one. Just because you're both media companies, this would be like if you set your two friends up based solely on height. You didn't look at gender. You didn't look at preferences. You didn't look at anything. You're just like, you're both 5'9". Perfect. You can share clothes. Like, like this doesn't make any sense at all. I understand why they're doing it. Um, I'd fire everybody who works at at and If I was Discovery, I would wonder, why do I want this? None of these assets. You know, It's not like Guy Fieri can cross over to Game of Thrones. Like This makes very, very little sense. And I'll tell you what I really think coming up later on. Uh, and then... I've got our own Anurban Mahante on Twilio and Fastly earnings. So it is an action-packed show. And of course, we would love your questions and comments. We're going pretty broad in the market here. So ask us whatever you like. Say good morning. Well, say good afternoon, depending where you are. Let's start with the first question. I will go to Max first. One, will growth stocks recover quickly? It has been a brutal time for growth stocks. Uh, and will they recover quickly? Max. So I, I, you know, Matt and I on the team here tend to think a little bit uh, differently about valuations. And we thought, you know, in the last year, hey, these are getting a little crazy. Uh, so I think the recent pullback makes sense. And, you know, um, although I'm not going to say like, don't buy, get out of the market, you know, hoard cans of beans and ammunition. Um, you know, I've been buying throughout, you know, every month, right? So you can say buy the dip, but I would say set your expectations to be realistic. Don't expect, you know, if you buy now that you're going to be sitting on gains in two months, right? I think it's be realistic about uh, how the market is starting to place a value on growth. I think those premiums are starting to deflate a little bit uh, and it's gonna be a little touch and go here in the summer, right? The recovery is already kind of upon us. I think a lot of high expectations are priced in. Uh, I can see a lot of sideways movement maybe until the next earnings releases and updates, uh, you know, at the end of July through mid August. So um, we might not get a whole lot of excitement here in the next couple of months. This is also a great time to look at the fundamentals. Uh, uh, not us at 7 Investing, but lots of people in the investing world got caught up in buying the, the latest tech spec of a company they didn't really understand. This is a real time to go through your portfolio, especially when it comes to, to newer growth stocks, and go, why did I buy this? And does that reason still make sense? Um, you're seeing irrational exuberance when it comes to some of these earnings reports. Uh, you, you know, you'll get... Uh, you know, you'll get Disney reporting 9 million new subscribers and the market will be like, oh, that's terrible. Like it should have been faster. And then you'll get Fubo adding 100,000 subscribers, which is an irrelevant number. And the market's like, hooray, this is absolutely awesome. So it is a very, very strange market. But Steve, you own some growth stocks. What are your thoughts here? Right. Um, so the question, will growth stocks recover quickly? I, I think the, the responsible answer is nobody knows, right? Um, but one thing we do need to keep in mind is that while well, stocks, you know, big pullbacks are more common than you think. Um, but when stocks do pull back and, or even cohorts of stocks, right? While the rest of the markets, you know, broad indexes are at all time highs, growth stocks are falling hard. Uh, they tend to fall a lot harder and faster than they rebound. So, uh, but they, they tend to climb over time more than they fall. So that's sort of the the point of patience, right, is we have to recognize that stocks fall hard and fast and the rebound is not always quick. 
Uh, but I think, you know, some growth stocks might recover quickly when it becomes evident uh, that the, the pullback was sort of overblown for certain names. But I think some consolidation, uh, as Max was sort of alluding to, would be a healthy thing uh, if we had some kind of sideways movement and, and built some bases in order to allow uh, a broader return to growth uh, or in a broader um, bull market to kind of resume. I would also tune out the whole concept of a recovery. I've said this many times, but we're not smashing our computers and never using Zoom again. We're just gonna like go to the mall without a mask. Like it's not some like, and yeah, maybe we'll travel a little bit more this summer, but I don't know about you, Steve Mac, or Max, but when I travel, my phone comes with me. Like I'm still gonna check my seven investing Slack. I'm still gonna broadcast from all sorts of places. It's not like I'm going technology free. We've got a great comment from Daniel Kern. We're gonna take this one before we move to item, uh, big question number two. I bought half my portfolio because my buddies at seven recommended them. And that is still a great thesis. Yeah, we're <laughs> in this for the long term. We don't, you know, sour on a stock because it had a bad week or because, you know, I, I hate even using the word analyst because it's basically like, like, you know, taking fortune cookie advice. Like, you know, these are not people who are really looking at the long term. We're analyzing companies, breaking it down and thinking about where they're going to be in three years, five years, 10 years, not where they're going to be when some, you know, guy goes on CNBC and says, oh, it's going to be down 4% tomorrow. Like that's just preposterous. It's like, it's like predicting second quarter basketball scores. It makes absolutely no sense. Question number two, and I'll start with Steve on this one. Is there ever a time you don't add new money to your portfolio? Um, I mean, when I don't have it, <laughs> I guess that, that's, that's when, it, but uh, yeah, I, I, this is a great question because, you know, it sort of touches on a, something that I've kind of tweeted about over the last week, it, you know, sort of the wealth hack tweet that some of you might have remembered. Um, it's, it's what you should do is just continuously add to your portfolio month after month as your cash flow allows. Uh, take any money that you, you can live without for a couple of years and put it to work in the stock market every month, no matter what, just find some good high quality companies. The rest kind of takes care of itself, you know? And and I see too many people that say, all right, I've got $5,000 and they put it all in the stock market all at once and then they're mad when all of it pulls back at once. Like, well, just buy continuously for your entire life. And, uh, and these dips and these spikes and all of it just sort of evens itself out. If you're buying shares of great companies at reasonable valuations, yeah, just continuously. Yeah, I'll, I'll chime in and say that two of my seven investing picks are incredibly solid companies that have had really, really strong earnings reports. And for market sentiment reasons, the stocks haven't performed that well. That eventually catches up where at some point the analyst going like, well, they're not going to be able to do that well next quarter. Uh, doesn't play out or what bad results get interpreted as surprisingly good and you have the opposite effect. You really can't look at quarters. You have to look at years. Max Chatsko, your thoughts on this one? Yeah, same as what Steve said. You know, only time I don't add is when I don't have the money. But uh, maybe, you know, here, let me pivot this a little bit to like younger investors, right? I'm the youngest on the team. Just rubbing that in one more time. Uh, you know, <laughs> but like, I'm, like, you know, when you're in your 20s or whatever, um, you don't always have money or it feels like so, you know, like a futile uphill climb like, oh, I'm going to put, what, 100 bucks in the, at my portfolio every month? Or maybe it's only 50 bucks. But do it. Do it. I mean, if you order out food, like, you know, four or five times a month, maybe three times a month, maybe just cut back on one time. And that's 40, 50 bucks you have. And again, it seems like such a small and significant amount. But, you know, 50 bucks a month, that's $600 a year. By the time you're 30, which is what age I am now, just rubbing that in one more time, um, <laughs> You know, that adds up. That's, you know, thousands of dollars. And the power of compound interest really plays out there. Plus, you're forming good habits. Maybe you have more money by the time you're 30, hopefully. Uh, and you're putting right. more in every month. So, um, you know, form those habits and your, your future self will thank you. If I could go back in time, the number one thing I would do is in my 20s, when I was making no money and living in New York, I would put that $50 a month in. Now, it wasn't as easy to do back then. There, there wasn't commission-free trading. Uh, you really kind of had to use a broker. A broker didn't want to deal with you know my $50 investment. But if the conditions were what they are now, I would go back and make those very, very tiny investments because now that I'm in my 40s, um, you know, I'm more than a max and a half here, um, there are... I don't have that timetable. I can't say like, well, when I'm 87, I'll be able to use some of this money. Well, as much as I hope to work forever and never quote retire, 
by 87, you might not be able to, to make a full income. You might not be in a position. You might just be tired. Like I don't usually get tired. So, uh, you know, that could change in the next 40 years. So I have to sort of plan on that normal, like 67, 70, needing some of that money. So, you know, the compounding isn't as long, but no matter what age you are, it is always a good time to invest. We would love your questions and comments, questions about investing, questions about whatever you would like, questions about our weekend, recipes, whatever it is. We are happy to talk to you. Question number three, are investors overthinking when it comes to potential change behavior due to the pandemic? I fully think they're overthinking this. Like, it's yeah, there's going to be a little surge in travel. It's not like we're all of a sudden going to be like, all right, let's spend the next six months in Vegas. Max Chatsko, your thoughts here. Yeah, I almost think this like is like a narrative in the media and they write articles about it. Is there any data that that's actually happening? Like are investors like, oh, I'm selling all my tech stocks to buy restaurants and, and travel. Like, is that actually, is there data around that, Dan? Yeah, so we've seen a little bit of shift in what stocks people are buying, but I would call that, you know, a retail level, not so much an institutional level. And we are seeing some travel trends. If you look at like Disney bookings, they're way up for, for the holiday season, uh, obviously compared to last year where they were you know more or less closed, if not closed <clears> in that time period. But I would expect this to be the busiest Walt Disney World Christmas, you know, Thanksgiving through Christmas ever if they're open at full capacity with all the hotels. I expect it's going to take a while on, say, like the cruise lines to ramp up, uh, you know, or for, you know, all inclusives are going to continue to do really well. I think, uh, yeah, is Chili's going to do better because we can eat out a little more freely now? Sure. But I don't think any of those are going to be massive trends. Like, yeah, I'm going to have my whole family over for a party in June. And that's that's not typical. Um, am I going to do that every month? So might that be good for the grocery store near me? But for the most part, I actually think, you know, this is being wildly overplayed. Steve, yeah, your thoughts there? Well, one, one quick comment there, just again. Um, so I agree with that. And, you know, I think it's important if we, if we zoom out, we take a step back, um, you know, remember that the pandemic pulled ahead by several years, you know, the digital transformation of most industries. So yeah. that growth is real and sustained. It, just because we're going to go out to bars this summer, we couldn't do that last year. doesn't mean, you know, tech companies or growth stocks are are no longer uh, viable businesses or anything, or that growth's gonna vaporize. So, um, you know, think about the digital transformations and these trends have been accelerated by several years now. Yeah, right? and that that is also a negative too. So if you look at movie theaters, uh, and I just wrote a piece about this, this accelerated, I don't wanna call it the death of movie theaters, but the change of movie theaters, the need for less movie theaters is probably the way to put it. Um, so you're gonna see this all over, but again, do, do I think everyone's going to like stop and smell the roses and appreciate life for the long term? No, that's not particularly American in how we do things. Steve, your thoughts on this one? Yeah. Um, Max the whip or snapper took the words right out of my mouth. Actually, that was that was really my uh, my thoughts there. I, I agree with you on the, the retail side, the consumer side. Um, but uh, there is undeniable progress and there's been an undeniable acceleration in enterprise digital transformation and we've seen that with a lot of businesses that basically they got right in the middle of the pandemic and they said well we're going to do this eventually anyway now's the time and uh so they they accelerated their their digital transformation efforts uh so you know companies kind of shifting to a cloud shifting to recurring product models uh, and really kind of capitalizing on consumers' behavior, however temporary it might be, in order to kind of push forward those, uh, that spending. So uh, I don't know how much of that is, is pulled forward that will not happen uh, going forward. I, I think a lot of it's going to prove sustainable because this is a, once we've moved to a cloud-based kind of digitized enterprise model, uh, then it's just continuing uh, spending uh, on that model to basically sustain it. So uh, yeah, that's the big thing is uh, is where um, changed behavior due to the pandemic is really reflected the most, I think, is, is in the enterprise, not necessarily with consumers. Yeah, we're also going to see some other change behavior. I'd be surprised if the suit came back strong. Uh, I would think that tra travel patterns are, are, are going to change. I, I've talked to you know, I've talked a lot about how like the lines at your coffee shop are, are different because commute patterns are different. 
Uh, I think we're going to see some changes to airfare routes because maybe like a lot of people who work in Silicon Valley move to Nevada or Arizona, but they're still going to have to regularly go to the office. So we might see routes that weren't traditionally commuter routes. Like, you know, you could always fly New York to Boston 10 times a day or, or West Palm Beach to Baltimore 15 times a day, like whatever it is. I think you're going to see more of that, but those are going to be sort of like micro trends that happen because you know maybe companies realize like all right like it's good to be in person but we don't have to be in person seven investing audience you have been awfully quiet we would love to hear some more questions and comments uh we you know we of course know you're sitting back in uh in basking in max and steve's wisdom here but you are welcome to participate as well question four we're going to finish up with this one what's something that conventional wisdom has wrong uh, mine would be that the Cowboys are going to be good next year, but uh, that's that's not the direction I'm going in. Steve Simon, your thoughts? Here. Um, so I, I guess we'll we'll give this an investing spin. I mean, there's a lot of a lot of directions we could take that, right? But uh, something conventional wisdom has wrong. Uh, I, I think the the wisdom that you should always buy low and sell high, right? Uh, I think. And so in some cases, that makes a lot of sense where it's like, you know what, this pullback is unmerited. I'm going to take advantage of it. But in a lot of cases, buy high, sell higher makes sense uh, or buy high and just, you know, just continue adding, I guess. And and uh, and it, it's, you know, sell when a life event merits it. Uh, but buy high, sell higher, I think, is, is maybe a better piece of conventional wisdom wisdom than buy low, sell high, because that just sort of implies a, a trading attitude. And, and we're long term investors here. Now, don't take that to mean buy high and sell low. That would be a that would be a terrible idea. You know? <laughs> I, I'm teasing a little bit, but we don't think in terms of price targets. We don't think in terms of where you buy. We see some comments rolling in. We will take them after Max weighs in on this one. Yeah, just to echo what Steve said, I mean, that, and that goes back to the first question, right? So like when we said, do you expect a quick recovery in some of these growth stocks? I think the answer is necessarily no. Um, but again, it's like in three or five years, it doesn't matter, right? Like all these good businesses are going to be bigger. Yeah. Um, so that's that's what I'm getting at with that. I'm not trying to, you know, time markets or anything. Conventional wisdom, everyone gets wrong. I, I think I'm always, I always question when companies and businesses chase growth in China. I think this decade is going to be very different geopolitically. We're already starting to see that now. And, you know, I see some things like those long tail risks. What if American companies or Western companies are kind of banned from China or vice versa? Um, and suddenly all that, you know, the rug gets pulled out from under those businesses. And some of those are very dependent on those those growth profiles in, in the Chinese markets. Uh, maybe even, you know, I don't know what like Tesla has, like some significant growth prospects there. Obviously, like Apple and Starbucks, they'll be fine. But I think that would be a pretty big shock to the markets. Um, you know, if anything happened there, I, I don't think we're going to have this uh, quite as globally connected uh, economy as we have now, 10 years from now. I'll play a little bit, uh, you know, counter on that and say that I don't expect China to kick out existing companies. They might not buy from them in the case of Tesla. They might not be as cooperative, but as a country, they do want foreign investment. So if all of a sudden they're not playing nice with Tesla, that is a really sort of tough way to go to another company and say, oh, hey, could you put a theme park in here or could you invest in other ways? So I do think on the tech side, on the financial services side, geopolitical tensions are going to get very difficult with China, not so much on the goods side, on the on the stuff, on the restaurants and that much. Uh, one mm -hmm. of the things I'm going to say with, with conventional wisdom, I don't think business travel is dead. Every time somebody like invents a technology that makes it easy to do what we're doing, and, and I've lived through this like since like my, my early career in the early 90s, went to do a video conference, like I would have to go to like a room in New York and like it'd be a big deal. And the reality is people don't travel for business to have the meeting. They travel for business largely for all the other things around the meeting, the social part of it, the looking each other in the eye, the ability to, to get to know each other. So will some meetings happen via Zoom? Sure, but some meetings happened over the phone or some meetings weren't even meetings. Uh, you know, They would just happen via an email chain. So I don't expect any massive shift in business travel in the long term, in the short term, we're seeing really weird supply and demand. I, I have a flight to Charlotte in July that has been rebooked by Southwest like 15 times, and it's getting to the point that I might just drive. Like it's just not, 
It's just not a convenient itinerary. And by the way, I'm not going to Charlotte. I'm going to Columbia, South Carolina, uh, which is an hour from Charlotte. And rental cars are crazy expensive. So there's going to be some weird short-term things, but those things are going to end. We're going to take a question from Stock Investor, uh, though we're going to answer it whoever wants to answer it. It doesn't have to be a max question. Uh, and it's, do you own any crypto? And if so, what are your overall allocations? So I joined Coinbase and I bought $100 worth of I don't remember what because I wanted to see how Coinbase worked. I have to say the more I learn about crypto, and this is not fair to our partners at Crypto EQ and people who are, are truly invested in here, to me it's magic, it's air, it's, it, it's, it's not real. And I understand that there are some people can, that can under, it's gonna make money, it's gonna go up. For me, I wanna understand what a business does and why it's valuable. I can't do that with Dogecoin or Bitcoin. And I don't even know which ones the scammy ones are and which ones the real ones are. Uh, Steve, do you want to weigh in here? You do that podcast uh, regularly with our with Crypto EQ. Yeah, uh, I don't personally own any crypto, but uh, I'm, I'm certainly not against it. And I, I understand it's it's potential long term viability for providing uh, sort of a, a, a neutral global currency, right? And and who knows what's gonna you know probably be Bitcoin in some form or other. But uh, I see the argument, and uh, and I recognize kind of the bull case for it. Uh, I'm more interested in investing in sort of the un underlying infrastructure that supports it, like blockchain technologies and such. There's a lot of ways to play that uh, or businesses that even hold it on their balance sheet. There's a growing number of those. Uh, I don't own it, but uh, I, I do think there's a place uh, for it potentially in people's portfolios and um, just a, a, a way to expose yourself to it without directly purchasing it. But uh, but yeah, uh, I, I see the bull case. Max, you want to weigh in here? Yeah, so uh, I have a funny story. I kind of get uh, some flack from it from my <laughs> fellow lead advisors here. But uh, years ago, I bought this little cryptocurrency called Cardano, and it was at like 12 cents. And uh, so my older brother has done very well with crypto. He's been mining it for like over 10 years before it was cool. So I bought $100 worth of Cardano, and it was at 12 cents. I hate to look at the price anymore. It was over $2, I think, like Friday or Saturday. But I lost the credentials for that wallet. So somewhere out there, I have a, <laughs> I do own technically like a thousand dollars or more in Cardano, but I have no way to access it. This is before it was on Coinbase or anything like that. So uh, I guess technically I own Cardano, but uh, <laughs> not anymore, <laughs> really. <laughs> I've I've said it on Twitter. I want to get post to make Alpha Bitcoin. I don't know why this isn't a thing. It could have digital marshmallows. Like I'm not sure why this isn't happening. We've got a great question here from Scott Engelberg. Steve, I'll let you read that one. Um, so, I mean, this this can turn into a really loaded question. I could talk about this for a long time, but what are your thoughts on Palantir? PLTR is the ticket for that. I'm very intrigued as I hear strong opinions on both sides for this company. I own Palantir, uh, actually, full disclosure. And uh, I, I do like it. I was actually really impressed with their most recent quarterly report. I, uh, when was that, like last week? Uh, and I think I saw it was uh, government revenue was up 83%. Commercial revenue was up 72%. They're sort of opening the doors uh, for commercial users to actually step in. And this was sort of a black box before. Uh, and I think they provided guidance for revenue to increase 30% or greater through like 2025. Uh, we also saw kind of some operating leverage come into play. So I think uh, operating margin a year ago was like 7%, swung to positive 34%. Current guidance calls for 23%. Um, yeah, uh, I, I'm very interested in Palantir. Uh, it's, su it's wildly volatile. Uh, though, you know, when we saw some news, I think actually this morning, the Wall Street Journal was talking about how Palantir was down because George Soros, uh, his investment firm rather, sold off 18 or 19 million shares because he disapproves of the way management runs it. Uh, you're going to want to be able to tolerate management who they're very unique individuals. Right? Yeah, I, I, I'm with George Soros on this one. <laughs> <laughs> not... Yeah, so, so a lot of people don't like him. Uh, but then they have a very unique style. Uh, read one of their shareholder letters and you'll kind of get a feel for what they're all about. Uh, Palantir is a really interesting company. I think they're going to be a lot bigger uh, 10 years from now. And I think they're going to do quite well for investors who, who kind of buy uh, now and, and hang on and have a stomach for volatility, but uh, whoo, volatile. And there's a, there's a lot of, a lot of weirdness uh, in some some places with the executive, so I'll just say that. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll call it the Washington Football Team conundrum. You know, last <laughs> year, hard to not root for Alex Smith, and then you remember, oh crud, I'm rooting for the Washington Football Team, and 
Dan Snyder. Uh, of course, those of you who actually know me know that goes a little bit deeper than just uh, the actions on the field. Mike Fee has a comment here, uh, which I will share if Sam wants to bring that up. Uh, well said, Steve. Investing in crypto picks and shovels companies are a better way to gain exposure in the space. That that might be true. Um, I'm not. I'm not sure if we have any recommendations in that area, but of course, members right. can check that out. If you would like to become a member of Seven Investing. On this Friday, you get access to our members only call. What do we do in the members only call? Well, first of all, Steve and Max will wear their members only jackets. Uh, and then we will, of course, take your questions about our past picks. We'll also share some best buys. Uh, one time only, we're gonna share some things we're buying just because the market has been so volatile. So if you'd like to join us on that call, Steve will get you out an invite if you join before Friday. That is seveninvesting.com slash subscribe. Just gonna take one or two more comments. In fact, I think I'll push those to the end of the show because we're up a little bit against time here. Um, and I want to talk about the AT&T spinoff of Werner Media. Uh, so they're gonna merge Werner Media and Discovery. This happened, of course, Sunday night, the news broke. Could you please not do this? Like, I, I wanted to watch Saturday Night Live. I haven't been home in a couple of days. Like, I don't need to stay up to like two in the morning to watch uh, a company I really like in Discovery merge with a weird group of products in like I'm if I was an AT&T shareholder I'd be thrilled to get out of this they spent 85 billion dollars buying Warner Media and they're taking back something like 49 million it's a little murky and this new company which is going to be owned 70 percent by AT&T shareholders and 30 percent it's 71 and 29 technically by Discovery shareholders but is going to be led by Discovery's CEO it's gonna start with $55 billion in debt. That is not great, but here's what the issue is here. So Warner Media owns HBO, they own TNT, they own TBS, they own CNN. Discovery owns a whole bunch of content that fits together. They own HGTV, they own Food Network, they own uh, Lifetime, the Magnolia Network, that's Chip and Joanna Gaines. Uh, they, they of course have the Discovery Plus service. Why do I not like this? is besides back office functionality, I don't see this as being two sets of content. I'm not sure you can say, okay, HBO Max is $14.99. What if we rolled in, uh, you know, Chip Gaines takes a nap or whatever ridiculous content they're doing on, on Discovery Plus or, or 90 Day Fiance, uh, you know, the ones that broke up or whatever, there's like 700 spinoffs of that. I don't see how these two assets uh, complement each other. And I look at the world and I say, okay, I'm going to get Netflix. I'm going to get Disney Plus. I'm going to have Amazon Prime because aside from Max, we all just have Amazon Prime. And then I'm going to get very picky and choosy. And my picky and choosy includes $4.99 for Discovery Plus because we watch Diners, Drive-Ins and Dives and Restaurant Impossible and all sorts of uh, house hunters, all sorts of things. It do, and at the moment includes HBO Max because I did want to watch Zack Snyder's Justice League. That was a mistake. Uh, but in normal times, it would not include HBO Max. And nothing about this deal to me accelerates either one. If they said, okay, we're going to combine these two services and they're $17.99, I might go, yeah, I don't want $17.99 for Discovery+. Plus. So do I think they've created a juggernaut that can compete with Netflix and Disney? No. And they spend $20 billion a year on content. Netflix only spends 17 billion, but Netflix is a focused product. HBO Max has a chance. I'm not saying that the HBO brand, but as cable dies, are you going to see people carry over their subscriptions to a new service? I'm not so sure they will. HBO does not have a big hit show right now. The closest HBO has a hit has to a hit is probably Last Week Tonight with John Oliver, which they make available on YouTube. Uh, you know, so that is not Great, and do they have a, a Sex in the City sequel coming? Yes, they do. Do they have Game of Thrones uh, spinoffs and prequels and I don't know, dragon singing? I'm not sure, yes, they, they have that. But HBO doesn't have a Sopranos. It doesn't have a Sex in the City. It doesn't have a show that if you're not watching it, everyone else is talking about it and you can't. So to me, this is a giant gamble. These assets don't go together. It's not like all of a sudden, you know, there's a value add to like Wolf Blitzer being a judge on Chopped. Like, the, you know, of course you had the great CNN Anthony Bourdain partnership and maybe a Bobby Flay or someone like that could be, but that's one show or one tiny little bit of programming. 
I'm not so sure this is a good deal for anybody except AT&T shareholders. And if there's anyone on the board still that made the deal to buy Warner Media, they need to be fired. Like this was a terrible, a historically terrible deal. I've read that this company could be valued at 150 billion. Seven Investing could be valued at 150 billion. Like that's like, you know, as I was looking at real estate, everything says, oh, steps to the clubhouse and restaurant. Well, anything is steps too, unless it's across an ocean. Like, so I think there's just a lot of sales on this that I am not a fan of. I guess we have to wait to see how it shakes out. I do like the discovery management, but I thought discovery had a real chance to be a massive niche hit as just like a, you pay the 499 and you have a lot of their content that you don't have to pay that much attention to. The volume of content is great. They can produce a ton of shows cheaply. It doesn't cost a lot of money to produce Chopped or Diners, Drive-Ins and Dives or any of the million cooking shows they do. Now they're moving into a world where they're lumped in with HBO HBO is $100 million failures. That is terrifying to me. Thank you for listening to my rant on that. There will be more to come on this. We will try to get to some of your comments, but assuming the video works, uh, I taped last week a whole bunch of things with Anurban Mahante, uh, but he is going to talk about Fastly and Twilio earnings. Sam Bailey, if you want to hit the tape, that would be appreciated. We are back once again with Anurban Mahante. And you can tell by the fact that, well, you can't tell because I wear the same outfit every show, but you can tell with Anurban <laughs> that uh, we've done these all in one day because he actually has different outfits. I, I have a very Fred Flintstone <laughs> slash Zuckerberg approach where I don't want to have to think about clothes. If I could just have the, the row of printed animal dress that Fred Flintstone wears and that was acceptable for every occasion, I'm not sure I could pull that one off. Fred, Fred, Fred was a bulkier guy than I am. But uh, you know, if I could do the Zuckerberg thing and just wear the same exact thing in every scenario, I would do that. But uh, in your case, different sweaters, different outfits, but we're going to talk about Twilio and Fastly earnings. Let's start with Twilio. Um, this is one where what the stock is doing is not necessarily connected to where the earnings came in. Is that fair to say? I think so. Although, you know, the same argument that you just made before that, you know, maybe the stocks were, had pulled ahead uh, apply. Like Twilio is a fantastic, Twilio is basically a communications as a service company platform, they have these tools that allow other companies to digitally connect with customers. That's very powerful. And doing a few other things in the call center, you know, to help with telehealth and so on that, you know, with the video calling features that I think um, make it a very, very interesting company. And this is not a, a small minnow, right? So in the first quarter of 2021, it's reported just to ten million, ten million dollars less than six hundred million, right? So six hundred million dollars of sales up sixty percent, sixty-two percent to be accurate, right? This is growth at scale, right? So if you just take six hundred times four, that's like two point four billion dollar run rate, growing at sixty percent. That's phenomenal, <laughs> right? So that's phenomenal. Just just phenomenal if you think about the scale. <laughs> They're being caught up in general negative market segment for this space. Are they also being caught up in this ridiculous argument of, well, they had 62% this quarter, but they're not gonna have that next quarter. <laughs> well, you know, the next quarter guidance, they're a little bit conservative in guidance. The guidance is very strong. They're saying they can, they're gonna learn about, let's say, you know, call it 600 million next quarter again, which is gonna be about 10 million more than the previous quarter. And that's gonna be up somewhere around 47, 48% to 50%. So they're basically saying they're still gonna do repeat that performance again. Remember, these companies all enjoyed a pandemic bump as well. So they actually had acceleration into the pandemic. Pandemic, you know, if you think about the US coming out of the pandemic, large parts of work coming out of the pandemic, they're still seeing the acceleration. So I think this is this digital acceleration is on. And uh, they're really good at selling this, you know, more to their customers, right? So they have a usage-based model, which means as people use more of it, they're going to, you know, see more billings to it. Uh, the dollar-based retention rate, which basically measures how much money they're making from the customers that had a year ago, that are still there this year, in in and so looking at how much they're spending this year versus last year, they're spending thirty percent more, right? So dollar-based retention was thirty-three percent more, one hundred and thirty-three percent. That means the cut, the platform is sticky and super viable, and and this is a great growth story, right? So. Sticky is good on a platform unless it's a restaurant. Uh, that, 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 that was always one of my problems, my problems with IHOP. You cannot go into an IHOP and not have every surface be sticky, which is just not what you're looking for. And I'm being a little silly here, but let me, let me wrap up with Twilio. Twilio is a prime example of a company where it looks like everything's going right. 
So the fact that its stock is trending down probably means it's a buying opportunity. Is that a, a reasonable read on this? So like, so here's the thing, like I personally on Twitter, I've not sold anything. I haven't added any because my Twitter positions actually hadn't gotten, hadn't gotten really large. Uh, so I think if you can, if you can be patient, $2.5 billion run rate at 60%, even if this thing grows at 30%, I think what people just keep forgetting, I, I, just doing some mental maths helps. Let's assume the 30% growth is there. 30% growth means you're doubling every three years, roughly. Let's call it 35%. Then you're actually growing every every two years, roughly. At 35%, you're you're doubling every two years. This, you know, in next two years, it could be a five billion dollar run rate, and then another two years, it could be another three years, it could be a ten billion dollar run rate. That's a huge company growing at a pretty phenomenal pace if it continues, right? And it's very it'll be odd to expect that a company growing at 60% all of a sudden slows down to 20%. That doesn't generally happen, right? And you see that in software, a lot of software companies, uh, Salesforce we have talked about before, has been growing at 20% plus at $25 billion run rate. So there's a huge opportunity here. This can be a much, much larger company. Again, my favorite is dollar cost average into these companies. If you have wanted to build up your position, great time to build up your position. Don't have to go all in. If this is going to be a multi-bagger, it's going to be a multi-bagger over time, right? So you have time. And, and I think that makes it just easier to buy. I just like to buy great companies over time. But just because a company's price is down doesn't mean it's a good buy. You're not as bullish on Fastly's results. Is uh, let's let's take a read. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so here's the, I think you know so the, the the words that I used for Twilio growth at scale. I wish I could use the same for Fastly, right? So Fastly's problem I think is so Fastly's number at a high level actually does not look bad. It's reported I think thirty five percent earnings growth, but here's the catch. Its first quarter revenue was only $85 million. So you're growing at 35% at 85 million versus you're growing at, you know, from Twilio's case, 600 million and growing at 60%. That's like, that's like completely different words, right? So Fastly doesn't seem to be showing me growth at scale, which I really need to justify a high multiple and really justify because as we talked about, these sort of companies really bloom at scale. That's number one, I think, the issue I see. It's, and it's too quick a dissolution in my mind. The other thing I think that's an issue with Fastly right now is if you look at actually organic growth, it's 23, 24%, because they quite a company called Signal Sciences, and that's now built into it. Uh, so they're growing at 20%. That's actually a little worrying to me. There's some execution issues I feel at, at Fastly. I personally hold the stock. I haven't sold it. Uh, so again, I like to just leave companies, good companies with an opportunity to run. So I think Fastly is a good company, it's just I think, have, having execution issues. Uh, Dollar-based retention number, though, was phenomenally strong, again, about 130%, which means that those customers that are using Fastly continue to love the product. But there's some issues with margin, and I think they're having some trouble acquiring more customers. I don't know whether it's competition or whether it's just they don't have a properly uh, worked out go-to, you know, uh, go to market model, all of those things matter, but I think I would like to see more acceleration. I think that there's another nuance I would like to point out. This is getting into nitty gritty detail, but I'll point this out anyways. So people could say that, you know, Fastly is cheap, and it is. Let's say, well, we look at the cash on balance sheet is like a billion dollars. The problem then, and we were talking about this, is that that billion dollars came from a convertible note that converts at around $100 share price. Fastly share price right now is less than $50. Short interest is at 17%. And I've seen this story, this sort of story happens, you know, this sort of story plays around quite a bit. Another problem now, now for Fastly is Fastly is also losing bleeding money because it's, you know, investing for growth and it's actually bleeding. It doesn't have free cash flow, it's negative uh, free cash flow. If nothing changes and it can't get back its share price, that billion dollars that was going to convert to shares actually has to return back as billion dollars in cash. Where is the cash going to come from? And if it has to raise that cash via debt, that debt is not going to be probably at a good rate. Or if it has to raise the cash via equity, that equity dilution is going to be significant. It's, there's a different dilution that, you know, it's a dilution factor of two, 50 versus 100, right? And I think a little bit of that is playing. All of this could go away if Fastly could just get its go-to-market uh, strategy to actually work, right? So if it can 
increase the pace of growth. It can actually diversify its product, which I think signal sciences allows it to do. Build more modules that they can then do, you know, upselling. Um, things could improve. So, you know, I, I think Fastly is cheap. I'm uh, continuing to hold the shares. It's not something that I'm looking to add personally. Like I would not, you know, like what I'd say, I'll add to Twilio or some other company. I'm not going to add to, uh, or I said, you know, add to, you know, Simon's April Rec, for example. I would not add to Fastly personally, but I'm not selling. It's a weird, you know, people say, you know, it's either a buy or sell. So for me, I am a very slow seller. I just don't sell very often. Um, but that's a personal situation for most people. That's no, my I, take on I Fastly. Think I think we're all very slow sellers. I'm going to ask one last question on Fastly. Do you think there's a possibility uh, that there is pent up demand here and there are companies because of the hit they've taken during the pandemic that are just waiting to pull the trigger. This is a, it's not an entirely necessary product. It, it's a, a value add type of product. So could there just be like some crazy blowout quarter, like three quarters from now when we're not living in a pandemic? I don't think so. So I think this is going to be, I don't think this that's going to be the case unless here's the thing, right? So one of the things that's hurt them is the TikTok, which was a large contributor to their, to the revenue and actually usage of their product. Uh, moved away, and there was, you know, some uh, ker ker kerfuffle going on between the White House and, uh, you know, uh, the Chinese and things like that. There was a political, geopolitical tension involved in that mix. But put that aside, I mean, basically TikTok migrated away from that platform, and they haven't been. So yes, it is always possible that the they go-to-market strategy lands up with one huge customer, which all of a sudden, because they're the usage-based platform, you get this one huge customer, and then all of a sudden your usage goes up, and then your revenue boom goes up. I have a feeling this is going to be a little bit, what I would love to see is that acceleration in growth. So the organic growth went from 23% to 35% and then to 40%. And then it can maintain that 40% rate. I would be very happy. And I think the market would start rewarding them for that. The market right now feels that this company has actually kind of lost its way. And there was a lot of talk about, you know, these things that they're going to do that's probably not happening. So the market is saying, show me the money <laughs> or show me what you can do. <laughs> Anurban Mahante, uh, how do we follow you on TikTok? No, you are not on TikTok. None of us, in fact, are on TikTok. Thank you for doing this. Uh, we will do it again soon. I would say you've earned uh, a beer, but it's like seven in the morning, so uh, we would probably frown upon that. You can have a mimosa. You can, uh, you know, I'm going to have a Nasdaqri later, a drink I've made up in honor of the Nasdaq, uh, which is not a real drink. We will see you soon. Welcome back. Thank you, Honor Bond. We're going to close out uh, before our finisher with a bunch of comments. Three last comments. So, Sam, if you want to bring up the comment from Joey K, we will start there. Uh, what worries me the most about crypto is that in the real world applications, the prevailing use case seems to be crime. Yeah, we saw that with the Colonial Pipeline. I don't know that that's the prevailing use case, but Max, you're nodding here. It does make it really easy to, to hide and launder money, right? I so I want to frame this. I hate the comparisons between crypto and fiat, right? Like we saw this recently with Elon Musk talking about the environmental impacts of Bitcoin. The reality is, and then people come out and say, well, what about the emissions of the banking sector? And it's like, well, yeah, but the banking sector is like the whole world, right? So if you look at like energy emissions or emissions per transaction, Bitcoin's off the charts compared to like the US dollar, right? So when it comes to like people pointing out the crime aspect of cryptocurrencies. I mean, there's plenty of crime that happens with the US dollar. Have you watched any shows on Netflix? Or I don't know, right? Like money laundering and all kinds of things. Yeah, Max, I'm older than you. So I prefer my crime to be the sack with the dollar sign on it. Yeah. But that, that that's just my generation. Steve, any thoughts on this one? No, I think Max summed that up pretty well. I feel exactly the same way. Steve, I'll let you feel the comment from Sandeep David. You could read that one as well. Sure. Uh, does C3.ai do the same thing as Palantir? Uh, C3.ai, their ticker's AI, and Palantir's PLTR, again, uh, we mentioned that earlier. Um, they, they don't do exactly the same thing. And, and I guess by reading their sort of high-level company descriptions, you know, you'd kind of be forgiven for thinking that. Uh, I also own AI as well, um, for full disclosure again. Um, but Palantir is uh, is kind of unique in that it is built, um, you know, it has two main products, Foundry and Gotham, where uh, it allows its enterprise clients and, you know, big government clients, which is kind of where it got its start, right? And it was founded, I think, six years earlier in 2003. C3.ai was founded in like 2009. Um, 
but Palantir allows people to integrate like huge data sets and sort of extract actionable insight. And it can provide the, the input required to train AI algorithms. So um, that's kind of where you are with Palantir, where C3.AI is kind of the only enterprise pure play in the, enter, in the artificial intelligence space, right? So they provide um, the ability for enterprises to implement artificial intelligence platforms to suit their own needs at scale. Um, so not necessarily, you know, they do have some data analytics stuff um, and, and C3.ai has a, a bunch of different products that are sort of, you know, some that are custom built for, for their clients, some that are sort of uh, out of the box solutions to do certain things. But um, I don't know if that convoluted it even more <laughs> for people who don't fully understand, you know, the concepts of machine learning and data analysis and big data. Uh, they sort of play in the same spaces and they're going to, <clears throat> to cross over. Uh, they're going to cross swords sometimes, and uh, that that is going to happen. But their core businesses uh, aren't exactly the same thing. And I think you know the the broader markets that they operate in, uh, there's room for multiple winners anyway. So I, I think there's room in in portfolios to own both stocks. My issue with C three AI is they started their company with C three, and they don't make protocol droids. I am not sure how you could possibly <laughs> do that. Uh, it, it, it just C three PO AI. Yeah, if if my company's called R two something. Like mm -hmm. then you're going to expect a lot of bleeps and bloops. In this case, I want a fussy six thousand yeah. language speaking uh, protocol droid. You, you got to appreciate their their uh, little ingenuity grabbing the .dot ai uh, the internet suffix though for their website. I love that. Go see three .dot ai, and that brings you right to them. Not bad at all. Uh, we're going to take Mike Fee's comment, uh, <laughs> and then we will move to our finisher. Uh, so Mike says, uh, Dan. What's the current environment for cruise lines? Are they open for business? Uh, have you booked something? So here's what I'll say, and I'm gonna be a little bit ginger about this uh, for a variety of reasons, but partially because I have some insider info. Um, the cruise lines, all the US cruise lines are gearing up for a mid-July start. This does not include Disney. Cruises are not relevant to Disney's bottom line. So they're gonna cancel longer. Uh, they're gonna wait, especially with, with the percentage of kids. Uh, but it does look like you're going to have cruises out of Florida and Galveston at some point in July. There are some holdups. Uh, those need to be 95% vaccinated passengers. Uh, and Florida right now forbids you from adding, asking if someone's been vaccinated. There might be some federal ways around that. There might be some lawsuit ways around that. There might be some ways of making it uh, voluntary, but if you don't do it, you can't get on. I'm not sure. So I am cautiously optimistic. Uh, do I have some cruises booked? Yes. Fourth of July week, I will be cruising out of Bermuda. Um, that seemed like a great idea. Now it doesn't seem like as great an idea because it maybe in a few weeks later, I could have done out of my home port and not had to fly to Bermuda, which is not all that convenient. And then in August, uh, I have something booked out of, uh, out of the Bahamas, which is a much easier flight. That's like a 40 minute flight, so not a big deal. Um, but I do have friends who work in the industry uh, across multiple lines, or at least people they know go across multiple lines. Uh, and some of them have been offered contracts, have been sort of put into a very complicated quarantining procedure. Basically, you have to quarantine, you get to the US, quarantine in a hotel room for a couple of days, take your tests, then you have to quarantine on board for two weeks, then you get your first shot, then you have to wait your three or four weeks. It's usually three because they've been getting Pfizer. Uh, and then you have to wait another two weeks. So this process is ongoing. And the timetable says mid-July, but uh, you know a lot of things could set this back to August. But I do sort of assume somewhat normality by the fall. I mean, look, today is a day where Starbucks, Target, Costco, who knows who else dropped mask requirements uh, for vaccinated people. So we are seeing, uh, you know, as we call it, a return to normal, but we are running out of time. Sam Bailey has a meeting at the top of the hour. Sam, maybe it's time we should hit our finisher. Which service business do you think will be most successful in the long run? 31.5% uh, say ride sharing, 16% say food delivery, 28% say grocery delivery, 24.5% say none of the above. Uh, I lean towards grocery delivery. I think I've seen the technology where in 10,000 square feet, a regional grocery chain like Publix for not a ton of money can automate order picking and service more than one store from loca one location. That makes a lot more sense to me than like 20 different restaurants or 100 different restaurants being serviced. Now, does this all change when there's autonomous driving? Maybe, 
but don't get fooled by those Domino's commercials that show like, first of all, it's like a full size car that can, that can carry two medium pizzas. Like it doesn't feel like the Noid needs to sabotage that. That feels like self-sabotage. Like that can't possibly be efficient, but that's not how we're delivering stuff. Max, do you have any thoughts on this one? I would agree. That was my answer would be grocery delivery. And I look at it from the economics, right? So I think ride sharing is still kind of niche and maybe what will always be niche again, maybe years from now when we have autonomous driving, that would be different. Food delivery, it's like the 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 chart the fees you pay as a percentage of like the bill are pretty high, right? You're gonna pay like fifty dollars to get a burger. Like the convenience isn't really worth it there. But for groceries, I mean if you're spending a hundred, two hundred dollars on a grocery trip and you can get that delivered and that's only a ten or fifteen dollar fee or whatever it is, like that the economics kind of work out, right? You can justify the convenience of that for an eight or fifteen or whatever dollar fee. Uh, so I think the economics work out, like the percentage of the fee as the total bill makes the most sense for grocery delivery. I'm the one who ruins that. I ordered five items from Whole Foods yesterday, but one of them was salmon and it was kind of expensive. So I got to the $35, but my five items showed up in three different bags because they won't mix like your salmon with your beverage. Like, you know, that, that was the rare loser, but I would say most people are actually doing their grocery shopping. Steve, what's the final word on this one? <laughs> the, uh, I, I voted none of the above because I'd rather be in other industries <laughs> investing. Uh, but uh, if I had to choose between the first three options, I'd say grocery delivery as well. And I think for me, it's the value proposition as a consumer, right? It, it saves me from walking through the store and picking out all this stuff myself. Uh, you know, I can go on, you know, I've done it from Costco a few times where I select the items I want to pick and, and, you know, they call me if something's out of stock, it's super handy and I don't mind paying an extra 15, 20 bucks. So I don't have to drive all the way across town to Costco, navigate their parking lot, go through their lines and get all the way home. Like that's fine by me. Um, but I, you know, food delivery, I, I've never, I, you know, let's save pizza, which is just their own infrastructure and ride sharing maybe over the long term. For like a Tesla, once they get their their robo taxi fleet done in fifty years, but that's <laughs> I don't know uh, about the rest of it. Uh, it. Yeah, I'd rather go grocery delivery. Yeah, I will point out that this question wasn't where will I invest because I would argue that I would not invest in any of the pure plays. I'm not investing in Uber Eats. I'm not investing in DoorDash. When Instacart goes public, I'm not investing there. Now, there are a lot of efficiencies they can build in. Instacart has a massive amount of people that they will not have at some point. They can, they can do the order part of it uh, pretty easily from a technical point of view. But I do think as an additive point of view, when you're talking about a Costco or a Walmart or a Target, and Target has its own infrastructure here, so that's helpful, their ability to say, sometimes you're gonna come in, sometimes you're gonna do curbside, sometimes you're gonna do delivery, sometimes you're just gonna, like during the pandemic, I was ordering two day from Target because we couldn't find the taco shells we like. So we had to like <laughs> make up our order to get to like whatever dollar amount. And like, I would say the ratio of broken to not broken was roughly 50, 50. So it was largely eating like tacos that were like kind of in a shell. You're eating but, nachos. <laughs> yeah, it, it, was, it, was, it was a glorified nacho, but with that, we are out of time. We're going to be back Wednesday, of course. If you'd like to get a hold of us, that is info at seveninvesting.com. That is questions about your membership, uh, questions about the service, how it works. You should really join before Friday when we have our new member call, our member call, and a special 12.30 p.m. edition of 7 Investing Now, which usually has a whole bunch of us. Uh, you know, Maybe there'll even be some special guests. If you want to follow us on social meeting, media, that is at 7. That is at the number 7 investing. We are very active. It is always fun to vote in our polls, to comment on our stuff. It's not all financial. At 7 Investing is. Our personal ones are not all financial, uh, but we promise they're all entertaining. For Sam Bailey behind the glass, Max Chasco, Steve Simonton, I am Dan Klein. We will see you Wednesday.